welcome to CNN 10. We are kicking off the second week of coverage of our fall season. We know a lot of you are just now getting back into the swing of things, so we thank you for doing that with our show. I'm Carl Azuz. Last week, America's Democrats had their time in the spotlight as their party convention was held Monday through Thursday. This week, it's the Republicans' turn as their event officially gets underway. Like the one before it, it's expected to be a largely virtual convention with social distancing guidelines keeping delegates from having the giant stadium-filled blowouts we're used to seeing. A scaled-down gathering is still set to take place in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the convention will allow Republicans to officially nominate incumbent President Donald Trump and incumbent Vice President Mike Pence for a second term in office. Other goals of the event include laying out the party's priorities and drumming up voter support for the November 3rd election. Experts say President Trump is hoping the Republican National Convention will have more live programming and audience response than last week's Democratic National Convention. By tradition, the party that holds the White House holds its convention second, but there's no tradition associated with a pandemic, another example of how these are very unusual times we're living in. Hundreds of wildfires are raging in California. Here's a quick by-the-numbers look. Cal Fire, the State Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, says there have been roughly 12,000 lightning strikes in California since August 15th. They've been blamed for starting most, if not all, of the 615 new wildfires that have flared up in the past week. More than 1,100,000 acres have burned, and firefighters are doing everything they can to contain these blazes. This doesn't necessarily mean putting them out. It means keeping them from spreading. That can be done by creating fire breaks, places where vegetation has been cleared out, for example, giving the blazes nothing to burn and nowhere further to go. All right, guys, I'm going to get down here, okay? Firefighters trapped on a ridgeline in California. The only way out is up. No, I got to get down here. It's like right there. A helicopter crew braves gusting winds to scoop them away to safety. You know how close it is, guys? A close call here, but it is a pitched battle across the state to put out more than 500 fires, many caused by lightning strikes. Officials say two of the blazes are among the biggest they've had in almost 90 years. More than 12,000 firefighters are battling the flames, many working 24-hour shifts, but so far it is not enough manpower to hold back the fires which have burned an area bigger than the size of Rhode Island. Neighbouring states are sending help, but state officials say they need more. We've also reached out across the border uh, into Canada for resources and support. And many of you up here recall, I think it was 2017, some of the best uh, wildfire, wild, wildfire firefighters in the world from Australia. Uh, we also have requests out uh, for uh, that talent as well. Officials say there are too many fires right now to save some homes and nearly 120,000 people have been evacuated. Though some people are taking it into their own hands to protect their property. When we got here, flames were all out in front and halfway down my driveway. My house was set way back, so um, we just started getting to work and uh, we put the fires out and and uh, so far we've saved it, but you never know. In previous fire seasons, prisoner firefighters have been used to help contain the blazes, but authorities say there are fewer of those resources now because of early releases due to the coronavirus. Forecasters say dry thunderstorms are in the forecast, which could bring more lightning and strong winds to the region, making the job of those trying to stop these ever-growing wildfires even more dangerous. Up next, coronavirus has created a conundrum for campuses across America. Some have reopened, some have partially reopened, some have gone virtual. The challenge for universities has another layer. This fall, more than 75% of them are expected to be partially or fully virtual, but questions are being raised about them charging full tuition fees without providing face-to-face -face instruction. Some have offered discounts. Some are struggling to find a balance when they do provide face-to-face -face instruction, but it coincides with the spread of coronavirus. 
A number of COVID-19 clusters have formed at universities across the U.S. where students have been invited back for some form of face-to-face -face instruction. Now, some schools have gone completely remote with virtual learning only. Others have a hybrid system, a combination of in-person and virtual learning. These schools sometimes have very strict rules when it comes to wearing masks and social distancing, but they still can't control 100% of student activity. For example, we've seen where students have thrown some off-campus parties, and in the case of Syracuse, at least 20 people have been suspended for throwing a party in their quad. Now, Florida Atlantic University begins their fall courses on Monday, and we spoke to one family who moved their son into those dorms. Here's what they told us about the virus concerns. I think it's everywhere. I don't think there's any hiding from it. And I think just trying to protect yourself, you know, is the best that you can do. You know, I think the school has been good with as far as hand sanitizers, the social distancing. You know, they have a lot of steps in place, so it's made me feel a little bit more comfortable actually being here and seeing the steps that they're taking. On that campus, some of their safety measures include not having any in-person classes when there are more than 50 students per class. And when there is face-to-face -face instruction, the number of students in the room is greatly reduced. FAU did report three of their football players testing positive for COVID-19. And that's why football practice is temporarily suspended until they can review the next round of tests, which is scheduled for Monday. Natasha Chen, CNN, Miami. 10 second trivia. What is the term for a space rock that enters Earth's atmosphere and hits the ground? Meteor, meteoroid, meteorite, or metroid? Meteoroids become meteors when they enter our atmosphere and meteorites when they hit the ground. Just like meteoroids are relatively small rocks that are zipping around in space, asteroids are bigger ones and two of those have been in the news recently. The first one passed very close by Earth on August 16th. It was about the size of a car and scientists say it probably wouldn't have hurt anyone if it had entered our atmosphere. But NASA missed it. The agency didn't pick up on the asteroid until after it had whizzed by less than 2,000 miles away. And researchers say that makes it the closest asteroid ever known to pass by Earth and not hit it. NASA didn't miss another asteroid that's headed our way. This one's about six and a half feet in diameter and should zip by on November 2nd. Scientists say the chance of this rock hitting Earth is about four tenths of 1%. They don't expect it to have a major impact or to disrupt the U.S. election the next day. We get questions here all the time about comets, asteroids, and meteors, meteorites. What's the difference? Well, let's start in space and work our way all the way down to the surface. A comet is a snowball. It's a piece of ice. Now, the ice is mainly frozen gas, not water, but there could be dust and rocks and things inside the comet. Halley's Comet. Now, NASA knows of about 3,600 other comets than that one out there. Closer in, in the asteroid belt, these are rocks, not gas. They could be metal as well, but they are hard surfaces. And sometimes they come out of the asteroid belt, get closer to the surface of the Earth, or at least our atmosphere. If one or a piece of a smaller one, called a meteoroid, hits the surface of the atmosphere, it turns into a meteor. It gets bright because it hits our atmosphere and begins to burn up. If it doesn't make its way all the way down to the surface, it turns into a shooting star. Now, if it does make its way all the way down to the surface of the Earth and hits the ground and you can pick it up, that is a meteorite. It's a summer tradition to try to catch the ice cream van as it meanders through the neighborhood. You ain't catching this one. It's electric. Woogie, woogie, woogie. And the British inventor who charged it up set a Guinness World Record for fastest electric ice cream van. How fast? Not as fast as a minivan. Its top speed was measured at about 74 miles per hour. But if you're trying to chase down a bomb pop or strawberry crunch on a hot summer's day, you could go nutty, buddy, falling all ory over yourself with your legs bubble gummed up and feeling like slush as you tried to push up close enough to this ice cream rocket. Woo! I'm Carl Azus. There is one way to get a mention on our show, and Medina Public School in Medina, North Dakota knows it. You comment on the most recent show on our YouTube channel. CNN 10 is back tomorrow.